Hey guys, welcome back to the continuing discussions on the thermodynamics of solutions. So when last we met, we described how a solution making process can be divided into a three-step series. We talked um, about most of the stuff up here in this corner of our rather busy looking slide. So we talked about expanding the solute and we talked that that was going to be an endothermic uh, process. You're going to need to put heat into the system to break up the solute to uh, break the ionic bonds, for example, in a salt solute. We talked about expanding the solvent and that that too was also going to be a delta H that's going to be positive because you're going to be overcoming some intermolecular forces, not all of them, but some of them associated with the solvent. And then lastly, we had delta H3 which was our mixing enthalpy, and we determined that that was going to be negative because now that we allow for the ion and the water to interact in an ion-dipole interaction type, that that was going to remove energy from the system because it was a stabilizing interaction. And so the final analysis we had that our heat of solution could be arrived at by combining H1, H2, and H3 and that the end result of this combination would give us either exo or endothermic solutions. So for example, if after adding H1 to H2 to H3, you get an overall positive heat of solution, then that solution is endothermic, and to your hand, it's going to feel cold. And that first video I showed you, I dissolved ammonium nitrate in the solution, NH4NO3, and that uh, dropped the temperature of the water, so we had a cold solution there. Or, on the other hand, if when you find the heat of solution by combining 1, 2, and 3, you get a negative heat of solution, then that, of course, is going to be exothermic. You touch it, it's going to feel hot. And trust me when I say that lithium chloride would give that result for reasons that we're going to explore in a little bit more detail as we go through. What I want to do in this video is put a picture to this H1, H2, H3 process to help you be able to uh, imagine how we can quantify this a little bit more clearly. So I have here two enthalpy diagrams. We call these enthalpy diagrams because we're combining different enthalpies of our three processes here to get an overall result. Um, you saw these uh, in sophomore chemistry when you talked about using electron capture and ionization energy to figure out the lattice enthalpy of a salt. And so you did diagrams like this last year. These are actually a lot simpler than those. So here's what I'm showing. I'll talk about the diagram here on the left first. So I have here, at this energy level here, we've got an unshown energy axis going up and down here. So I have here the energy of the solute and the solvent separated. So imagine the Erlenmeyer of just water and the, um, the beaker containing the solid salt. I haven't yet poured the salt into the water. So what do I have to do energetically to make a solution? Well, I have to expand the solute, right? That's our delta H1 that I'm trying to show here in these little cartoons, right? I'm doing this expansion. So that's delta H1. That makes the energy of the system go up. Delta H2, expansion of the solvent, likewise makes the energy of the system go up. And I'm not being very particular here about my relative scale here. I'm just interested in that they both make the energy of the solution um, or the system, I should say, go up. Then we allow the solute and the solvent to mix. The ions of the solute are now interacting with the water molecules, uh, uh, say, for our solvent, um, and that delta H3 is negative, so that brings the energy of the system down. It's a stabilizing interaction. I'm now creating interactions which stabilize the system. So, if I go up, higher than I come down. So in other words, I'm on net, I'm higher up than where I started. That is an endothermic heat of solution that you can see pictorially from that enthalpy diagram. Conversely, if I start with my separated solute and solvent, expand the solute, the energy goes up. Expand the solvent, the energy goes up. 
and then I allow mixing. So I now I allow the ion of my solute to interact with the solvent molecule. If that is a nice strong interaction, maybe I come down further than I had initially gone up. And so this is how we get an exothermic heat of solution. So these are the two possible outcomes shown in enthalpy diagrams. Now, we want to begin to quantify these ideas. So I need to put numbers to H1, H2, and H3. As we're going to see, it's not going to be a problem for the H1s. That I can do. I'm going to have some problems for H2 and for H3. Okay, let's take a look at this part of the slide over here. I'm going to shrink this down just a little bit. I'm hoping you can read the blue there. Hopefully it's not too faded out. It turns out that H1 is actually a value we already know. What we're doing in H1 is we're expanding the solute. We're taking, say, let's play with sodium chloride, everybody's favorite ion, a compound. I need to take sodium chloride and I need to break it up into its ions. Well, this process going in the direction I show here in pink is actually just the opposite of the lattice enthalpy process. Lattice enthalpies that are tabulated in textbooks go from separated ions back to the solid salt. So H1 values are something we can do in the laboratory. I can take solid sodium chloride and I can just keep heating it and heating it until it turns into its separated gaseous ions. That would give me a fair value for the um, delta H1 that we need to have here. All right, So that's an experiment we can do. We run into some problems, however, when we start to quantify H2 and H3. The problem is this. I don't actually know how much of the solvent I need to expand in order for it to receive the solute. So it's hard for me to imagine an experiment where I quantify only a partial expansion of the solvent. So H2 is going to give me problems. Similarly, H3 also gives me some problems. It's hard for me to know exactly, let's take a look at this representation of H3 right here. It's hard for me to know exactly how much energy I'm getting back during this interaction. I don't know if one solute particle is interacting with one or two or three or four or five or six other solvent molecules at any given moment. So actually figuring out how much enthalpy we get back by mixing is hard to quantify by itself. So it turns out that H2 and H3 are hard to quantify on their own. But here's the neat thing. I can actually combine H2 and H3 together and I can evaluate them simultaneously. So let's go over to here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine H2 and H3 into a new enthalpy that I'm calling here the enthalpy of hydration, or you'll hear it referred to simply as the heat of hydration. The heat of hydration refers to this process. Take your separated ions, squirt in water, and see what you get now with the aqueous ions, the ions that now have water molecules attached to them. This I can actually do in the laboratory. I can take sodium chloride, solid sodium chloride, heat it up like heck to turn it into separated gaseous ions. I would do this in a calorimeter. I can then squirt into that calorimeter some water and then see how the heat changes. So I can do H2 and H3 simultaneously. Combine the process of separating the water and interacting the water with the ions at the same time. This is going to be called the heat of hydration. And it turns out that when you combine H2 with H3, you always get a negative sign. In other words, the energy you get back from mixing, which is negative, is always larger than the energy you needed to put in to expand the solvent. Or, in terms of our enthalpy diagram, H3 always comes down more than H2 initially went up. 
I don't do a very good job of showing that here, but H3 in this diagram, H3 does come down further than H2 would go up. So, one thing to know about heats of hydration is that they're always negative. H1 is always positive. The opposite of the lattice enthalpy is always going to be positive. The heat of hydration is always going to be negative. So now, my heat of solution calculation has been simplified. Now I get my heat of solution by getting the H1 and adding it to the heat of hydration. So, H1s are tabulated, they're lattice enthalpies that are the opposite of lattice enthalpies, and for a lot of ions, for a lot of ionic compounds, H1s are going to have very similar values, at least when we're talking about plus 1 and minus 1s, or plus 2s and minus 2s. As long as the ion charge is somewhat consistent, is kept consistent, the H1 values will be somewhat consistent as well. So, it turns out then that evaluating the sign for the heat of solution often comes down to evaluating the magnitude of the heat of hydration. So, in the next video, we're going to talk about the factors that affect the heat of hydration. So what I've done here is I've simplified the process of quantifying the heat of solution. Instead of having to worry about one, two, three steps, I now only have to worry about two. My expanding of the solute, which I can get from tabulated values, and the heat of hydration. We will explore the heat of hydration next.